Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you all at home and in the Zendo. Many familiar faces and a few new ones. Um, I was thinking just recently of a story that a friend told me. Uh, you may know we live in New Mexico and a friend of mine bought an old Adobe house and we, uh, you know, New Mexico has many houses that are hundreds of years old and he bought one of them thinking what a lovely uh, atmospheric structure to restore. And shortly after he bought the house, he discovered that the roof leaked and he brought in um, a roofer to take a look at the roof and it turned out that the whole roof was rotten and needed to come off. And so the roofer took the roof off and when that happened, the walls fell over and <laughs> we had no house. <laughs> so uh, it struck me what an interesting um, metaphor for the self, the self as we see it in in Buddhism, in Zen. Um, so a lot of us have um, heard the old um, comparison of the self to a cart or a chariot. You know, what part of the cart is actually, is the cart contained in the wheels? Is it contained in, uh, um, in the harness, et cetera, et cetera, that goes to the horse? Um, but that, that comparison never worked for me that well, but it strikes me that house is a pretty good comparison because, uh, what do we, let's suppose that we're just, we're looking for a house and we're just about to buy one and we're looking, uh, we look at one that just seems perfect and what are we, it has nothing in it yet, has no furniture in it. We're not living in it. What's the first thing we often say when we walk into a house? Wow, look at this space. What a great space, right? So we buy a house for the space. We don't buy it for the walls or for the ceiling, or even in this case, the house had no foundation, right? So we buy it for the space inside. So what happens if we take away the walls and if we take away the roof, uh, is there still houseness left? No, there's, we can't actually find the house, right? We don't buy a house for the walls. We don't buy it for the roof. We buy it for the space. Once the house has no walls and no roof, the space just bleeds into the next space over, right? So it strikes me that the view of the self or no self that we hear in Buddhism, it can sound so esoteric for, to us, but it's actually rather simple. What happens when we take down the walls of the self? Buddhism says we don't find anything there, right? The, uh, one of the things I've been doing recently with, with various groups that I give talks to here is we've been looking at certain aspects of, for, for lack of a better word, we call the ego self. Ego self is very difficult to define. What exactly is it? When we look within ourselves, we don't find one central self. We find kind of a committee. And if you've ever tried to do anything by committee, well, you know what that's like, right? So uh, uh, it's rather peculiar committee because um, there, are, there are multiple voices. It's really as though we have, uh, we all have multiple personalities, but it's not necessarily clinical, right? If we've ever tried to change a habit, then we know what this is like. One part of us wants to change the habit, the other part of us wants to hold on to it, right? One part of us wants to do zazen and discover what, what reality is like beyond the self, and another part wants to hold on to the self as fiercely as it possibly can, right? So um, when we try and this, this term, the ego, is a relatively new term, and we tend to apply it to practice, but it's not exactly what the Buddha meant by the self. Uh, however, it can be really interesting to look at what we mean by the ego. And near as I can tell, what we mean by the ego is a set of defenses. 
So one of the, uh, there's a tradition of mindfulness of mind and heart practice in, particularly in Theravadan Buddhism, uh, where you look at directly at what the mind's doing or directly at what the emotions are doing. And I've been adapting this a little bit based, uh, based partly on uh, some work done by Bernie Glassman, one of uh, our founding father of this lineage. Um, Bernie was very creative about adapting uh, all sorts of aspects of, of the ancient teachings to the contemporary day. So one of the things we've been examining in doing this kind of work is we look at self-consciousness and embarrassment, for instance. We, uh, what I'll do is I'll assign that to have people go away and look at it. And I, I highly recommend this because what is self-consciousness or embarrassment except, uh, except the ego, right? The only thing that is harmed when we're embarrassed or when we're humiliated is our idea of what the ego is, right? Our idea of what the self is, of what we are, of who we are. Um, other factors we look at are uh, taking things personally or taking offense. Those are clearly um, reactions where we are protecting this sense of self, this idea of who we are. But Buddhism says that if we take down these walls that make up the self, what we find is much like what we find if we take down the walls of the actual house or what happened to my friend. When, when his walls came down, not by his own choice, all that was left was space, right? There was no houseness. The house wasn't in the walls. The house wasn't in, in the uh, ceiling. The house had no foundation. So when we start to take down the walls of ourself, of ourselves, what do we find? We don't find anything there, according to Buddhism. Or another way to say it is there's space there, but the space bleeds into all other spaces, right? So sometimes we call it emptiness, which is in a way another word for space. Sometimes we call it oneness. There are two different ways of talking about the same thing, right? That emptiness inside the house becomes the same as the emptiness outside the house, right? They just run from one into the next. Not only that, but if we were able to look into all the objects that surround us, we would find that they're mostly composed of empty space. All these apparently, this cup is, there's an apparent surface, but it's really an illusion of a surface that's created by a bunch of molecules moving around very quickly, right? That makes the, the uh, illusion of solidity. And this is known scientifically that if you start looking at um, into the molecular and atomic structure of things, there's an awful lot of space there and there's not much stuff, right? So is the space inside here really separate from the space outside here? Or does everything sort of run together, including ourselves, which is really the point. So, Buddhism tells us that reality is fundamentally undivided. Of course, we also have these apparently separate selves, and there is some reality to that. It's not like, um, this is where Buddhism differs from Hinduism a little. Hinduism's a little more along the lines of the whole thing's just a dream or illusion. Buddhism is a little more like yeah, everything's the same thing and everything runs together and there's no such thing as a separate self, but we still have to take care of the relative world in which beings are suffering, right? Until we all see that we're not separate selves, then there's still suffering, there's still work to do, right? So it's interesting to look at what our walls are made of. What are these walls that protect the apparent self? And I had an uh, interesting um, thing unfolding in my university class. Uh, a lot of you know that I teach meditation for credit every semester. And we, I have a young woman in my class who has a newborn baby. And one day she couldn't find any um, 
childcare and she brought her child to class. And it was such a great, uh, such a great illustration of this because the child's only three months old. The child was a great meditator. She had him in a sling on her chest and she just sat that way. And I thought, what a beautiful way to, to sit feeling the child's heartbeat right against you, right? But it was such an interesting um, lesson for the whole class because because the child doesn't have a self yet. The infant doesn't have a self yet, right? The infant's a separate being. And it's very like the way Buddhism sees things. I'm not the same as Ando. I'm not the same as Joni. I'm not the same as Eddie Lee. And yet, what is the nature of this self that they say isn't there? Well, if you look at an infant, and we were all infants once, so we all experienced this once, the infant does not yet know that they're separate from their mother, right? They don't know they're separate from their environment. The infant is not enlightened because the infant hasn't, the infant doesn't know it's, it's experiencing wholeness because it hasn't experienced separateness, right? It's in a state of, of innocence. So the infant's not enlightened, uh, but the, the individuality that it has with no concept of a separate self is something akin to what we reclaim in practice. Although we go through a whole circuit and we don't lose our individuality, we don't lose our personality, we don't lose what we've learned, but we start to see through it. Right? I wonder if we can cast our minds back to what it was like before we had a sense of self. So the infant doesn't know her gender. She doesn't know her age. She doesn't know her nationality. She doesn't know what language she's going to speak. She doesn't know the world's separate from her. She doesn't know that her parents are separate from her. It's very, very like when we're fortunate enough to get a quiet moment in Zazen. Uh, Shishin Roshi said something akin to this once years ago that's always stuck with me. He said, when we're really in Samadhi, we don't know what our age is, what our gender is, what our state of health is, what our profession is. We don't know anything about ourselves, right? And yet, here we are. We still have the sense of, of beingness. So what's the nature of that beingness when we don't know those things about ourselves? That's, that's close to what we're talking about when we're talking about no self. So where does the first, where do the first walls of self first begin to be built? It's an interesting thing to look at. And having this infant in class, again, was a really interesting illustration of this. Pretty soon that infant's going to be able to say ma or ma, you know, some, some version of that is pretty uh, universal in all cultures. That oftentimes the first word is something for mother. Once the infant can identify mother, mother starts to become separate from the infant, right? There's nothing, until then, there's nothing to say, is there? <laughs> you know, it's only, there's only something to say once things start to become separate. So also the infant can't think until the infant has words. Probably the infant has little dreams and little pictures going through the mind. We don't really know. But as far as analytic linear thought, the infant doesn't have that until it can start to conceptualize. Once it can, once it can say ma, it can conceptualize mom as separate from itself. And once it has a handful of other words, somewhere along the line, it will start thinking, right? So once we start, once we have words, once we start thinking, the thoughts start to assemble themselves into stories. These stories are stories about who we are, and they're the stories I was just talking about. Who, uh, what our gender is, what goes with that? What our nationality is, what goes with that? What, what our parents, who our parents are and what they do? What language we speak? How old we are? What we're gonna, then we start thinking about past and future. What are we gonna do when we grow up? What happened last week? Maybe about the time we're five or six and we start to go to school past and future start to become important because the teacher was mean to us yesterday, they're gonna be mean to us tomorrow. The bully was mean to us yesterday, they're gonna be mean to us tomorrow. Uh, 
And then this whole world starts to assemble in our mind, right? But wasn't the infant a discrete being completely with all the sensory equipment there before the infant started thinking? So Buddhism, Buddhism isn't saying that Joni is me or that, or that Ando doesn't exist or that Tanya doesn't exist, right? It's saying that we overlay this idea of separation upon ourselves. And that starts to cut us off from reality. It starts to cut us off. It's inevitable. The baby has to do that, right? The baby has to have, in order for this body and mind to survive independently, the body has to do that. And yet the more we do that, the more we end up coming to Zen centers because we feel separate, alienated, alone, lonely. Uh, we want to know why we suffer, right? We want to solve these problems. And Buddhism says the problem all comes down to the sense of separation created by the idea of a separate self. Right? So are we really separate? Are we really separate? Where did we come from? We came from that infant who didn't know itself as separate and couldn't live as a separate being. Actually, we can't live as a separate being because we're portable and because we can walk around in space. We tend to think we're separate, but we can't stop breathing, eating, sleeping, excreting. We can't remove ourselves from the universe. We've all wanted to, right? We've all had some moment where we just like, take me, I'm suffering so much, take me, I wanna go. But we can't just go, right? We're not really in charge, are we? We can't, we can't just um, go back into undifferentiated reality and vanish but we can reclaim our sense of unity. So it, and it involves taking down the walls. So, so a lot of what we look at in, in Zazen, a lot of what we practice with is thought, right? One way to talk about what we're practicing in all forms of meditation is we're bringing ourselves to the present moment and we're experiencing the present moment, which is to say we're experiencing reality. I probably don't have to parse out why the future is not as real as the present, why the past is not as real as the present. Uh, I, we probably all get that the past used to be real, but it's not real right now, except in the cause and effect um, manifestations that still exist in us. Yes, the past still plays out as, in us in a way, but it's not as real as this moment is right now. So we could say that in Zazen, we bring ourselves to reality and we do our best to stay there. The only thing that really removes us from reality is thinking about past, thinking about future, or also judging the present or analyzing the present moment, which oftentimes involves judging our strengths and weaknesses, how we're doing. A lot of this is unconscious, but you know, we're, how are, if we were to remove thinking about the self from our minds, how much would we have to think about? Not too much, would we? Ever, so there is creative thought. There, is, there, is, there are wonderful aspects of thought, but you know, it, it really strikes me that we can use analytic thought to land somebody on the moon. Isn't that crazy? That's how precise it is. But do we think E equals MC squared helped Einstein with his wife? Probably not. It's the wrong, it's the wrong instrument for the job, right? If we can send a person to the moon or we can send a camera out past Jupiter. Have you seen those pictures recently? They're kind of amazing of, of, um, of the other planets in the solar system. With our minds, that's the right use of the mind. We can calculate how to send that that rocket out there so it can bring back those pictures. But we can't come up with a calculation to send somebody to love. If somebody doesn't know love, we can't use our analytic mind to get them there, can we? So there are certain things that the thinking mind is good for and certain things that it's not good for. And one of our issues is that the mind tends to take over and tends to think it's in charge of everything, right? Um, but trying to use 
the mind to understand love. We've all done that, haven't we? Haven't we all lain awake at night worrying about some aspect of, of some relationship, some love relationship, and we can't sort it out. We lay awake all night thinking about it and we, we don't come to any solution. And then we're taking a shower or something or we're driving somewhere and all of a sudden we think, oh, I gotta leave the jerk. You know, <laughs> it just, you know, it comes, it comes clear from intuition. It's like koans, right? In koans, we use thought to penetrate past thought. We use thoughts that are not uh, amenable to being solved by linear thought. And if we're, if we're fortunate, eventually an intuitive thought will arise that solves the problem. So, um, so using that, linear sequential analytic mind to try and solve things like the meaning of life which is a lot of why we come to to practice right or what's the nature of the self what's the meaning of life what on earth are we all doing here it's a bit like we're driving along and we get a flat tire and the only tool we have is a swiss army knife it's not going to help with the flat tire is it swiss army knife is a great tool but it's not going to help us with the flat tire we need a we need a tire iron or we're not going to be able to change our tire, right? So, so we could say that through thought, we build up a story of the self and then we start to defend it. But is the story of ourself, the real self? What's the real self when we let go of the story? when we let go of our thinking mind. That's what we're trying to discover through Zaza. So, it's good to remember that this no self thing is not some esoteric thing that we're going, it is true that through practice over years, we will feel our, I can't say understand it, we'll feel our way into it more and more deeply and get what it means but it's not far away from us to begin with anytime we're not rebuilding those walls of the self then we are at least glimpsing what no self is in zazen when we're not thinking here we are we're aware so what's the nature of that awareness and is it like the interior of the house once the walls come down, is it separate from the next person's awareness? Is it separate from awareness as a whole? It's interesting when one is in that state, if one's fortunate enough to have a moment of stillness, look out towards the horizon and ask oneself, is there a horizon? Does it stop anywhere? Does this awareness that this here-ness that's fundamental to our being and was there when we were born, does it stop anywhere? Does it have, does it have walls? Does it have inherent walls or does it only have walls when we put the walls up? Let's do a little experiment here with words. I just want to demonstrate. We, by the time we're adults, we're so fixed into words and, and when we get together with our friends, we blab, blab, blab. When we, when we're at our work, we blab, blab, blab. But when we read, we read, read, read words. Uh, uh, when, we, when we're running around through the day, there's this internal monologue. Um, Jill Bolte Taylor, who I met, I've mentioned in past Dharma talks, is a woman who was a neuroscientist who had a stroke that cut off the verbal side of her brain. And um, she went into this Nirvana-like state. It's really interesting to read her book, which is called, uh, what's it called? The Stroke of Insight, I think. Um, it's really interesting because she's not, she, she comes to many of the same uh, conclusions that we come to in Zen without coming through that door. She's a neuroscientist and, her, and the verbal part of her mind turns off and all of a sudden she's one with everything. And then the verbal part of her mind starts to turn back on again. And that's really interesting because she starts to realize that the, that the function of the internal monologue is to build up and reinforce the self. 
is to create this sense of self. And having seen, having glimpsed Nirvana, she doesn't want that self to grow back, at least not in the same way as it did before. She wants her, she wants her words back. She wants to be able to function in society, but there are certain aspects of that story she doesn't want. So it's really interesting. Um, you know, a lot of times we'll work with that internal monologue with, without really understanding what its agenda is. Its agenda is to keep self-reinforcing, right? Again, the infant doesn't have it. We didn't have it as an infant. We start to build up that story. We start to build up those walls. And then we re repeat it to ourselves over and over again until we think it's real, right? Here's a little exercise for us. So I'm going to ask you to just cast your eyes towards the floor, wherever you are. Now, I'm looking at a beige carpet, and that's words, that's concept. I'll walk through this room many times a day, and I'll think, if I think about it, I'll think beige carpet, beige carpet, beige carpet, right? Um, and you may be looking at a similar carpet with a different set of colors, or you may be looking at a wooden floor or linoleum or whatever it is. But notice the difference between what we label it as, even just for me, beige. Now, once I say beige, if I start looking closely, well, it's actually not just beige, it's speckled. Okay, what color are the speckles? Well, there's brown speckles, there's black speckles. But if I look into the speckles, aren't there all sorts of different shades of brown and black? And in the beige parts, aren't there all different shades of beige? And do those, all those shades, do they all have names? Even if you're an artist and you can, you know, you can name 15 different variations of beige because, because there's paints by those names. Aren't there variations in between that words don't cover, right? This is what we start to miss when we start to live in the story, right? We start to live, we start to miss those in between spaces. Does that make sense? Look how much we can see that can't possibly be contained in words. Even in that, I don't know, what do I see? Three square feet of floor? This, this three square feet of floor, if I really pay attention to it, it's kind of a miracle, right? Kind of a miracle. Um, all the variation there, but how much of it do I not see? How little of it do I see? The self is much like that. The self's much like that. Actually, if we look at this little patch of floor, we'll find that it's infinite. We look into it and into it and into it. Can you find it? Can we find an end to the variations of color and texture? Texture is even worse. About the only thing I can say about the texture is it's, I don't know, it's rough. It's fluffy. I mean, it's stippled maybe. I don't even know what stippled means. So there's about maybe three words for the texture of this floor. But the texture is infinite, isn't it? You know, so there's a, with my university students, I use a very simple koan with them. And uh, you've all probably heard variations on this koan, but um, it's a good example of showing how we use thought to go beyond thought when we're working with koans, or it's a good example of how our notions of thought and words limit us. So I'll hold up a bell like this or a bowl. It's got two names, bell or bowl, right? And any, they don't have to be Zen students to understand. I say, how many bells or bowls are there like this in the world? Thousands, millions, I don't know. Uh, you know, similar meditation bells or bowls, things you strike for meditation. Um, everyone is different, isn't it? And yet we've only got a couple of names from bell or bull, you know? And so this is the, this is the con formulation. You've all heard some version of it. So I'll say, if you call it a bell or a bull, <laughs> uh, you, you limit its individuality, right? There are thousands or millions of such objects and everyone is distinct and different. So you can't call it a bell or a bull, but come on. It's let's call it a bell for these purposes, right? Come on, it's a bell, right? <laughs> right, so you can't say it's a bell. You can't say it's not a bell. What is it? So usually stumps the class for some time. And then a lot of times I'll say, I, here's a hint, a five-year-old would, would be able to answer this. So as, you, as some of you may have guessed, the right way to 
respond to it is that, right? You come up, you grab the striker, and you hit it. That's what a five-year-old would do, right? Because a five-year-old's not bound by words and concepts in the way we are yet. So so I want to urge us in this brief weekend session, we have such a wonderful opportunity to see beyond thought and to understand that once we're seeing beyond thought, we're at least catching a glimpse of what we're talking about with no self. If we got beyond who we thought we were, what could we be? What might we be? And how, many, how many times have we come up against needing to make a change that runs in opposition to who we think we are? And how often do we resist that change? That resistance is one of the walls, isn't it? If we didn't have a fixed concept of ourself, we could change profession, we could change career, we could change where we live. We could go through a divorce, we could go through a, a serious illness. It's so interesting. You know, I'm always urging us to be creative in our practice. One of the ways to be creative is to notice how creative the mind is in continuing to rebuild it, rebuild this sense of self. So how does it do it? It does it through the past, through thinking about the past. It does it through thinking about the future. It does it. This is projecting the self into the past. This is projecting the self into the future, the imagined future. Or judging the present, weighing ourselves up in the present moment. How am I doing, right? If we really allowed ourselves to get focused and not be deluded by words coming through the mind, words coming through them, if words are coming through the mind and we're getting caught in them, we're conceptualizing. If we look a little closer, we'll find that most of those words have to do with me. It's a little bit of a daunting realization. But what if we all took on the practice of, in doing zazen, I know it's not about me. I, so any thought about me, if I can just catch it, and re, it's like catch and release, you know, like, like fly fishing, catch and release, catch that thought, this is about me, I'm going to release it, catch the thought, it's about me. If you catch one that's not about me, okay, you can keep that and cook it, all right? But you, you probably won't catch any like that, right? Every once in a while, they catch a thought that's a big insight. But that's pretty rare, and it usually you have to get rid of all those other fish first. Isn't it funny we use, I've gotten onto a fish metaphor here. Fish, fish um, gather in schools, don't they? And we speak of schools of thought. So you see, it's all connected. You see where the mind can take you. All right, so we could say we literally think ourselves into existence. What happens if we unthink ourselves? What happens, um, oh, there's a quote from Katagiri Roshi that I love. Um, um, Katagiri wa started looking into Western uh, um, philosophy and he said, you know, I think Descartes really has something. I think therefore I am. I wish he'd taken it a step further and realized if I don't think, therefore I'm not. Right? Isn't it funny? That insight's right there. I think, therefore, I am. That's what we're talking about. But, but if only Descartes had taken it one step further, right? Just like Category says. So just because we can't think our way into life's deep meaning and purpose and into things like love and into the, aren't these the, aren't these the core of life, the most important things in life, aren't they? The things we think about are not necessarily the most, things we think about are mostly like picking up milk at the market, you know, not so important. Even if we think great thoughts, you know, it's, uh, it's still when we're on our deathbeds, aren't we? Isn't love gonna be what was the most important to us? These things we can't think our way to. Um, but we can feel our way into life's deep meaning, but we can't feel our way into it if we're always trying to explain it to ourselves, right? I had a, I had a mentor and very good friend, uh, he's a professor of religion and philosophy who I, I spent a lot of time with. And uh, we used to talk about Buddhism a lot. In fact, he came to the monastery where I practiced with me several times and he was fascinated by it. 
but uh, he never really took on a practice. And once towards the end of his life, I said, why, Dr. Finch, why did you never take on an actual practice? And he said, well, I was sure that it could be done, that enlightenment could be reached purely by thought alone. And then he and I looked at each other. It was kind of a sad moment, <laughs> you know, because it was obvious that it hadn't happened. He hadn't, he hadn't realized enlightenment through thought alone. He'd studied enlightenment. He'd studied it. Um, he, when he was dying, his son came and took care of him for some months. And his son says, and I hope it's true, that his father finally found his way through as he was dying. And I, I sincerely hope it's true that he realized there was something beyond, there was a place to go beyond thought. And that's where he had to go. Um, so, I'll close with a story some of you have heard before. Um, it's from my book, One Bird, One Stone. It's about D.T. Suzuki, who was invited, the Zen scholar, many of you, if you have read about Zen back in the 60s, you would have read D.T. Suzuki, you would have heard about him. Um, he was one of the first scholars to bring, and practitioner, he was a scholar and practitioner, to bring Zen and all of Buddhism, in fact, to the West. And there was some sort of a, uh, in the late 50s, there was some sort of a world religions convocation uh, in, uh, in, at the Queen's Hall in London. And uh, a bunch of dignitaries and scholars and experts on religion were, were invited to speak on the subject of the supreme spiritual ideal. Now, you can imagine the Queen's Hall in London. I'm sorry, Tanya, I don't mean to disparage <laughs> Britain, but you can, can you imagine a more stuffy convocation in the late 50s than a bunch of scholars and, and thinkers holding forth about the supreme spiritual ideal in the Queen's Hall in London? Uh, they would have all been white men. They would have all been there in their suits, right? You know, um, holding forth and the audience would have been sitting there in rapt attention. Well, they invited D.T. Suzuki to speak on this, on this subject. And after hearing all sorts of other people hold forth on the subject, D.T. Suzuki takes the stage and looks out at the audience and he says, I don't know how such a humble person as myself is supposed to speak on something so grand as the supreme spiritual ideal. Really, I have no idea what the supreme spiritual ideal is. And with that, he he proceeded to tell the audience about his garden in rural Japan and how life there differed from life in a big city. And when he finished, the audience gave him a standing ovation. Now, that's an example of somebody going up without walls, right? Because what's he risking? He's risking being made a fool of. He's risking being thought a fool. He's risking being booed off the stage. He, uh, he's risking everybody rejecting what he has to say. He doesn't care. He's not going to go up and talk about some BS philosophical thing about the supreme spiritual idea. He's going to go up and demonstrate humility. And if humility is not a supreme spiritual ideal, I don't know what is. You know? And in so doing, he breaks down the barrier between him and the audience, right? In fact, there's no barrier to begin with between him and the audience. He goes up without walls. So, so this is what I'm talking about. What happens if we take down these walls? What are we actually risking by taking down the walls? Is D.T. Suzuki still there? Yeah, he's still there. He's still an individual, but he's not an individual who's barricaded against other individuals or against the world. You know, he's, a, he's, a, he's an individual who's dancing with reality in a state of, well, if it's not oneness, I don't know why the audience gave him a standing ovation. So they obviously felt oneness with him, right? So when we drop our walls, it's interesting to ask ourselves, so we still, we're still aware, we're still here in some fundamental sense, but what does that here-ness consist of? Is it discrete? Is it individual? Is it singular? Or is it something more like empty space? And if it's the empty space, like the empty space that was inside that house, 
Is it separate from the empty space outside? Can we, with no walls, is there any separation? If there's no separation, is there any suffering? So um, I'll really close this time with uh, saying something that Dogen says a lot, that we hear a lot from Dogen, which is you should carefully consider this point. <laughs> Isn't Dogen always saying that you should care to his monks, you should carefully consider this. Now, what's he talking about? Is he talking about sitting there and philosophizing? No, he's talking about taking the point in this case, when the walls come down, when we're not thinking, what are we? And not thinking about it, but using that as a point of deeper entry into practice. You know, a little bit of thought can come in. This is using thought against thought, just like using a koan against thought. Koans are thoughts, aren't they? But they penetrate beyond, beyond the thinking mind. So really, when I'm just here, I'm not thinking, and I'm not reinforcing my notions of self, what am I? Really good question. So we have some more hours together for the rest of today and for part of tomorrow and for future sessions to come. And what we're doing at the beginning, beginning of practice, we're still inside the house and we're just cleaning the windows so light shines in. And the light shining in is pretty gorgeous. If we haven't, you know, it illuminates the whole space inside. It's in itself, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But then what's the work? The work is to take down the walls. We're take, every time we do a retreat, every time we sit, we're taking down those walls brick by brick by brick. Then we have the opportunity to see what's there when they come down all the way. So please practice well. I'll see you this afternoon.